I have a part with a couple of pockets in it and it has a shelf. I've already machined this shelf with a contour tool path so we can see by the cut lines. So we'll turn those off and I want to add a pocketing tool path. So from the drop down menu I'm going to select tool paths, pocket, turn on construction plane chaining, we'll do this pocket first, we'll accept that selection. I want to choose a tool. Now when I did my contour I used a one inch end mill and I'll use it again to do this pocket because all these radiuses are 5 eighths so I have plenty of room for a one inch end mill. I'm going to set up appropriate speeds and feeds, enable rapid retract, add a comment. For now I'll just accept these defaults. So I'm going to go to cut parameters. In previous videos we've already looked at the other styles of pockets so I just want to focus on standard pocketing today. And I'll leave 50 thou on the bottom and 50 thou on the walls for a finished tool path. Now one important thing about the pocket tool path is this option right here, create additional finish operation. If I enable it now, when I click OK, it's going to create this pocket tool path to rough it and another modified pocket tool path to remove this 50 thou. If I forget to enable it now and I exit the tool path and I come back into the tool path by selecting parameters, it will be grayed out and I can no longer accept it. So I'm going to do a standard pocket, leave 50,000 on the walls, 50,000 on the floor, create an additional finishing operation, and I'll climb mill the pocket. So next I go to roughing. We have a lot of different roughing methods to choose from. What we're after here is our most efficient tool path based on our pocket shape. So typically you'll try one or two or three and look at your quickest cycle time. For now I'll go with the zigzag. I'll set the step over percentage to 70%. And unless this doesn't clean up the whole pocket, I'll be happy with that. I do want to minimize the tool burial, so I'll always leave that on. And the roughing angle we'll come back to after we generate the tool path. Next I'll go to the entry motion. I can shut it off, which will force the cutter to plunge. The default is to helix into the part, which always works nicely. And I can set up the helix parameters here. I can tell it to follow the boundary of the pocket. But if the helix should fail, the default is to plunge into the part. If I choose to skip it, the tool path won't be generated. When I'm entering the part, do I want the helix to be clockwise or counterclockwise? And do I want the feed rate for that to be the plunge rate or the feed rate set up in the tool? For this pocket, I'm going to use a ramping motion. So the minimum ramp is 50% of the tool diameter. Currently the maximum ramp is 100% of the tool diameter, but I've got a lot more room than that. So in the maximum length of the ramp, I'm going to right click. I'm going to choose the length of an entity. And I'll choose this entity here. So that's almost a little over two and three quarter inches. Our graphic here gives you a quick little look at what we'll see happening. It's going to start from 100 thou above the part. With, by default, it leaves 100 thou on each side of the walls. I'm going to change that to 50 thou. The angle is 3 degrees. Okay. So we can see our two angles here. I wouldn't encourage you to put it beyond 10, or you very likely will snap your cutter. We can also tell it to figure out its own angle. And we can set up the XY angle to come into the pocket at. And I'm going to leave these defaults. I can choose to align the ramp with an entry point or to ramp from an entry point. But again, I'll let it figure it out on its own. Next, I want to go to the finishing. Make sure finishing is enabled. When the tool path cuts the pocket, it's going to leave some scallops around the outside when the tool changes direction. This will take one pass around the profile and clean up all these scallops. So what I'm telling it here is when it roughs to leave 10 thou on top of this 50 thou and the finishing pass will remove that 10 thou as it follows the profile. Spring passes means follow the exact same profile more than once and this is useful if you have a lot of cutter deflection. Just like a contour tool path I can turn the cutter comp on however I like and I can also override the feed and speed for this pass. I'm going to tell it to start the finish pass at the closest entity. 
I'm just doing one pocket so I'll say keep the tool down and I'm also only going to machine the finished pass at the final depth. If I were doing multiple pockets with this I would tell it also to only machine finish passes after roughing all the pockets. If I had multiple pockets on this shelf and there's a very thin wall between them I would enable this but we'll leave that discussion for another time. For the lead in and out I'll accept the defaults and if there's an issue then I'll come back and change them. I do want to enable depth cuts because we're ramping down into the material I'll leave the depth cuts at 100 thou. I'll add one finish pass across the bottom and I'll make it 25 thou. Once again I can tell it to keep the tool down in the pocket so it doesn't come out. We don't have islands. I could tell it to create the geometry as a sub-program. And if I have multiple pockets I can say either cut the entire pocket first or by depth do a hundred thou in each pocket and continue to do that until you get to the depth. If the pocket has tapered walls I can enable this like we did in earlier exercise for a contour and tell it the angle of the taper. I don't want to break through in this case and then I'll look at my linking parameters. So I like all of my parameters at the absolute value. They all look good. I'll turn on the flood coolant. And we'll accept these selections and have a look at the tool path. So we can see the tool path Here's the rough and here's the finish. So there's our finish tool path. We'll shut its cut lines off. We'll only look at the rough for now. With the finishing, if I want to use a different tool, because currently it's using the same tool, then I'll go to the parameters, select the tool, and I'll select the tool from the library and I'll grab another one inch end mill. Whoops, I didn't mean to go to the filter. Just grab the one inch end mill and go OK. Let's do that again. Grab a new one inch end mill, say OK. It's going to warn me one exists. Do I want to add another? Yes, I do. I'll accept that. And I'll regenerate that tool path. I'll shut the cut lines off for the finishing. We'll go back into the parameters of our roughing. And if we now go to the roughing angle and change it to 90 degrees, accept that selection, regenerate the tool path we can see how it's changed to a much more efficient tool path. And if I want to simulate these, I'll select both and I'll go verify the tool path. Okay. I'm happy with that. We'll close the simulator and we'll save our work. To see the ramping, I can zoom in and we can see here's our ramp coming down into the part. So I'm happy with my toolpaths. I'll save my work.